Hi, everybody, and welcome again to this evening's uh, next episode. And I'm happy to uh, just welcome Lucy and Timothy this evening, who are going to be our speakers. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about you guys before uh, we, we start, and you can introduce us into AI and biology, which seems to be quite interesting term for me as well. Why did I choose it? <laughs> for good reason. Lucy, what are you doing on your daily basis? What's, what's your background? Uh, actually, my background is uh, mainly proteomics. I studied biotechnology and analytical chemistry and work uh, for several years in wet labs, uh, for example, on diagnostics of Alzheimer's disease or several types of cancer. But then I started to be more interested in, uh, in data science field because I was already analyzing a lot of data that I acquired in the lab. So I, let's say, switched or extended my skills for data science. And are you happy with the decision? I like uh, the combination of uh, proteomics and uh, machine learning or deep learning because I think that we can uh, find uh, an interesting information through these methods. The protonics for all those who have, have no idea, no clue what is this is. Can you explain that in a second or so? What uh, I think we are going to explain it a little bit in our presentation, actually. Oh, thank you. Yep. So at the beginning, you will get a really short introduction to the whole biology that you would need for our models. Awesome, sounds like a good, good plan. Thank you for that. Uh, Timothy, also welcome. Um, but what are you doing on a daily basis? Um, I'm currently a, a senior software engineer at Biognosis, which is a firm that is specialized in proteomics. Uh, we're located in Schleden, so very, very close to our old meetup location, <laughs> only 15 minutes away by, by foot yep. in the techno park. Yeah, <laughs> it's too bad we couldn't meet there today, but we may do. Um, yeah, regarding my background, uh, I come from a completely different field. I started uh, in physics. I have a PhD in physics. And after my PhD, I went to finance for about 10 years in very different roles, uh, being a quant, being a software developer. And uh, But after 10 years or so, I decided I wanted to move back to to science, so uh, I joined Biognosis. Good, well, a good idea. Uh, guys, uh, I'm going to start a poll at the moment. Of course, we would like to understand a little bit more about who's listening today. Uh, that makes it also quite more easier for us to adjust the, the presentations. So don't worry about me asking you the questions. It would be interesting to see your background a little bit. Uh, Timothy, um, the funny thing about you and, and uh, Lucy as well, uh, that was that we actually met before, of course. This is not the first time, right? So when you were one of those participants in the early stages of AI Swiss, so which makes me much more um, happy, uh, uh, so to say, because I see people from the community also just taking the, the, the chance, opportunity to speak here. Yeah, we were one of, I was definitely one of the, I didn't know Lucy that back then, but I was there at the very first meetup of, uh, of AI Speaks, before it was even the Pi and AI <laughs> meetup. Yeah, yeah. Pi and I, AI can actually indeed later in 2020, so it was pretty much late. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I think the poll is nearly reaching the end. Uh, yeah, let's start it and let's see what, what we found. I'm going to share the results. So we have uh, still again a lot of data scientists, software engineers. Uh, we have also well, at least one business consultant. Welcome from the healthcare industry. Also someone which is awesome in academia. Now better, better just be presented here because I'm asking. So that's good. We have also people with, with background in, in, in science. Uh, what is your level of knowledge in the deep learning space? Uh, so we have a lot of people who are not into the field. I think that's quite helpful. Maybe if you talk, uh, that we can just open to questions again for those who are new to the field. Uh, and we have 35% uh, 30, uh, down. I think it's a good mix for, for you guys when you when you uh, lead us or guide us into your field of expertise. So for anyone who just uh, joined us for first day and it's work, it's not really uh, 
comfortable with the, how it all works. It's pretty easy. You have a navigation bar uh, in on your screen, and you can see you can raise your hand. Uh, the easiest way is not to raise your hand. It's just ask your questions, and you're welcome to ask questions. There's a cool and A icon out in the navigation where you can always ask your question. So it's the easiest way. Uh, Lucy and Timothy will be focused completely on telling us uh, their story. So I will have a look at what kind of questions come up. So feel free and feel invited to ask your questions. There are really no silly questions at all. So thank you guys again for just being part of this evening. And as I say, take the floor, please. Thank you. Let me share my screen. And here we go. So, uh, yeah. You can see it. Can see it screen? Yeah. So, thank you very much for uh, the invitation to speak at the Pi NAI meetup. Uh, like so many of you, I got my start in this field during the machine learning course by Andrew Wang uh, on Coursera. So, this meetup has always been kind of special to me. Uh, my name is Timothy Mann. Uh, I'm a senior, senior software engineer at Diagnosis in Sweden. I'm here today with my collaborator, Lucy Piakofa, and we will talk about projects involving uh, deep neural networks that we worked on in our firm to improve our data analysis pipelines and our software. Uh, so let me start with an introduction to the field of proteomics. Uh, I know that most of you are not coming from this uh, field uh, or even biology or science. So I would try to keep it as simple as possible, but hopefully not too simple. Uh, flag me if I mention a technical term or abbreviation that you haven't, uh, that you have never heard before. Um, after that, Lucy will talk about her project, training a multitask model for the sole purpose of speeding up inference. And finally, I will take the word again and talk about how we approach model development, deployment in a very specific case of Windows desktop applications. Uh, I believe there will be time for questions at the end, but feel free to interrupt me if you really cannot wait. Um, so let's start about uh, let's start by defining the field of proteomics. Uh, what kind of methodology do we use to do the scientific experiments in these fields, and how can we apply deep learning models in the data analysis pipelines? So uh, to answer the uh, question of Stefan, what is proteomics? Uh, for that, we have to go back to the central dogma of molecular biology, uh, which states that, uh, I'm really hand-waving here, uh, that biological systems have an inherent information flow built in. So starting from genetic information that's encoded in DNA molecules, we pass through a transcription phase into RNA, uh, which is then used to build a functional protein molecule. Uh, as an uh, analogy, uh, we all like pi here at pi and AI, right? Uh, we can think of this process of having a recipe, which is the DNA. Uh, collecting ingredients, mixing and baking would be the transcription phase into RNA. And uh, pro proteins would be having a fully ready apple pie in the end. So the study of the proteome, so all the proteins in an organism or a system is called proteomics. So why would you want to study the proteome instead of the more widely known genome, or, which is in the field of genomics? So going back to our analogy, who would rather read a recipe for apple pie instead of smelling and tasting the apple pie, right? Besides, even if you have the same recipe, you might not end up with the same apple pie. The same is actually true for this whole workflow. There are mutations. You can have uh, modifications here and you have modifications there. And in the end, what um, comes out, the proteins might not actually uh, correspond to the original genes anymore. So there are several things, uh, several ways to do proteomics, uh, such as reverse phase protein microarrays, mic protein chips, and LC-MSMS proteomics. Uh, you can forget the first two because even I don't know what they mean, but we will focus on LC-MSMS proteomics today. Uh, as a, a quick side note, we will also not talk about um, structural proteomics, which is what AlphaFold is for instance famous for, uh, which is basically, uh, calculating how a protein folds in itself. The, the function of the protein is really dependent on how it folds together. We are not gonna talk about that. Our field is really um, quantitative proteomics. So LC-MS, MS proteomics is our workhorse. Uh, it is a method to do quantitative analysis of expressed proteins in tissues and organisms. So for instance, 
You can use it to find the differences in proteins between overweight and average weight individuals or between cancerous tissue and healthy tissue. You know what, which proteins are uh, changed so you actually can maybe in the future use that as biomarkers, for instance, if you want to detect cancer. Uh, LCMSMS, the technique itself involves three parts, three main parts. The first part is a method to separate complex protein and pro peptide mixtures, which is in itself a two-step process. The latter part is where the LC stands for, for liquid chromatography. Using mass spectrometry is the second step. Uh, you can measure the data to identify individual proteins. Uh, that's where MSMS stands for. And the third one, using bioinformatics, computers, software to analyze and assemble the mass spectrometry data, uh, that's the last step. We can go through them one by one. So we start, oh, we start with protein digestion. Uh, let me see. Sorry. Um, the reason why we actually need this step is because proteins are very large molecules. They're all built up on the same 20 amino acids, which is the basic Lego block that uh, you use to construct proteins, but can range from tens to tens of thousands of amino acids in length. And because of that, they also have very different physical chemical properties among themselves. Uh, to be able to measure these very different proteins in one machine and in one go, we digest the protein into small peptides. Uh, we basically cut it up into smaller pieces, uh, making it harder to identify them later, but making it possible to measure them now. Uh, we hijack a biological enzyme called trypsin most of the time. It has very specific rules. Uh, it cuts after arginine and lysine, but not before proline, which makes the data processing a lot easier later. So now that we have smaller peptides, which are more homogeneous in properties, uh, more stable and more easier to handle, uh, we measure these uh, as a proxy for the proteins. So now we arrive at our first acronym, LC, which stands for liquid chromatography. Uh, it is a way to separate in time the peptides arriving at the detector. So for that, uh, we have something called the LC column, which is basically uh, a big column full of silica beads, for instance, with certain chemical properties. And we inject the solvent that changes in time that, such that the peptides prefer to either stay in the column or move with the solvent to the detector. And the time that it takes to arrive at the detector is called the retention time because it stays on the column for a certain amount of time. And this uh, retention time, it depends really on the chemical properties of the peptide in question. However, it also depends on the small details of the experimental setup, like how long the column is or how fast you change the solvents, et cetera, et cetera. Luckily, it turns out that we can abstract a lot of these experimental details away by using something called the index retention time or IRT. It basically means that we rescale our retention time. This is like in hours or minutes, something like one hour or two, or two hours. We can rescale this retention time to two baselines between zero and 100 using two or more baseline peptides. Uh, think of it like you would scale Fahrenheit to Celsius using the freezing and boiling point of water. So everything is within that scale then. Uh, this will become important later. Our second acronym, MSMS, stands for the technique of tandem mass spectrometry. Uh, it's summarized by the schematic, where on the left side is the LC step. We see that the peptides are sprayed out during this process, and during this process, it will get ionized. That is, it will obtain an electrical charge. Uh, then it arrives at the machine called the mass spectrometer, or mass spec, uh, which measures both the mass and charge as a combined quantity. So what it does is it uses electromagnetic fields to basically crash molecules into the wall, except if they have the correct mass over charge ratio. It will then follow a, a nice little route to the detector. Uh, if it does uh, arrive at the detector, it will detect the peak, where the intensity of the peak is uh, basically an electrical signal, uh, where the intensity of the peak is a proxy for the quantity of the peptide. So once you have detected the peak, you know that you have a peptide with a certain mass and certain charge. But what you really want to know is the correct amino acid sequence. How is the peptide built up from each individual amino acid? 
you can't really tell from this one measurement because any permutation of the same amino acids will show the same peak because they have the same mass. So how do we measure which particular sequence we have? Well, what's better than one mass spec? Correct, two mass specs. We put them one after each other and we have, we have a little additional trick in between. We so-called fragment the uh, peptide. We basically break the bonds between the amino acids before we measure the mass overcharges the second time. If we do it correctly, we will measure something like this. Uh, during fragmentation, we break the peptide apart into smaller pieces called B and Y ions. Uh, an example is shown here on the, uh, on the top right. B ions are basically prefixes of the peptide where Y ions are suffixes. So we see a lot of peaks of different intensities. This is theoretically enough to identify the sequence because we know the masses of the individual uh, amino acids, but this is actually an MP heart problem. Uh, we need to use some smarts here to do that in an automated way. So finally, we arrive at the machine learning part. We start with some prior information here. Uh, all the possible proteins uh, of an organism, we take this information from the field of genomics. This first step is to reduce the search phase, make it more palpable for the algorithm to finish in time. We can now calculate where we expect the peaks to be because we know the rule for, the, for digestion. Remember, it was trypsin, so it cleaves after arginine and lysine, but not before proline. So we can use the computer to basically take the sequence and know exactly where it cuts. Since we know the masses of the individual amino acids, we can calculate the locations of the possible BMI ions in the spectrum. However, we know that every experiment has noise. Uh, sometimes peaks are just missing for one reason or the other. Sometimes we have extra peaks because uh, not a single peptide comes through uh, at the machine, but multiple comes through. So by pure chance, we might match peptides that are not correct. So here's a, a very nice trick also. We can create negative samples from the original database by mutating the sequence. So for instance, we can do random permutations or substitutions of amino acids. We can then check if this new peptide exists in the original database. And if it doesn't, we know for sure that we shouldn't match this peptide to a measured spectrum. It, it does not exist in real world. We combine these positive and negative samples into one pool. And after some manual feature engineering, like calculating correlation scores between measured and theoretical spectra, uh, we train a machine learning model to dis increase the discrimination power between positives and negatives. Since we know uh, we created them ourselves, we know which ones are true negatives, we can really estimate uh, the false discoveries pretty well. So where does deep learning fit in? Uh, we don't plan to replace the previous data analysis because it works very well, uh, but we might improve it by introducing features that were not possible to include before. More specifically, we want to add retention time as a feature. This has always been very hard to predict in CIRCO because you would need the really minute details of the underlying chemistry. Uh, there have been a lot of previous work trying to predict the, the retention time directly. So either from first principles, really like calculation, chemical, uh, chemical simulation and things like that, or using machine learning. But it turns out that uh, using a normalized quantity like the index retention time is actually quite important to make it work. Uh, additionally, using deep learning models also really help a lot in terms of precision. The second quantity we can use deep learning for is to predict the fragment ion intensity. Uh, as you saw from the, from the spectrum before, all the B and Y ions have very peaks of very different heights. Uh, again, this is really hard to predict in silico. So, so far, everything is basically say present or not present in the theoretical spectrum. Uh, because if you want to predict this uh, in silico, you will need to know the underlying physics of fragmentation, really like how does a peptide break apart by hitting a gas. Uh, so it's not that easy. But surprisingly, this can be modeled in uh, deep learning. Uh, so we can use these uh, outputs of the deep learning model as inputs for the previous machine learning model and see if we can improve uh, identifications of peptides uh, better. I will now give the word to, to Lucy, who will explain how we modeled everything with deep neural networks. So first, let's uh, look uh, again on the data 
the oh, derivative. This is sorry before I, before uh, you continue. Sorry for interrupting you. Uh, we have just the question is time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry. Spectrometry is same as cross linking mass spectrometry. Did you get the question or shall I repeat it? Sorry, no, I didn't know. I didn't get it. It's in the Q and A section. Uh, from someone anonymous uh, is asking. Is tandem mass spectrometry, oh, it's so hard to spell it, spectrometry, same as cross-linking mass spectrometry? Uh, I would have to be, uh, I would have to look that up. I really would not know, <laughs> to, to be honest. No worries. Uh, we, can answer, uh, we can answer those questions later on as well. So if you can provide it and I can post it uh, on, on, on the page actually, so no worries. Uh, I hope uh, we just keep the question and we ke I keep care of it, it will be answered. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Lucy, for interrupting. Uh, I'm sorry, I should have realized that there could be questions after we finished one, one part of the presentation. I will just ask them for the next slide here. Thank you. Uh, so I, at first, I would like to recap the data that we were using because you have heard a lot of biology stuff. So we basically had a peptide sequences as an input data, uh, which could look like something you can see in the middle. It's basically a sequence of letters and uh, each letter corresponds to the specific uh, amino acid. It's uh, an alphabet with 20 characters and 20 because we have 20 common amino acids in nature in our body. And uh, it's a little bit of abstraction because we don't want to work uh, with the proper chemical structure formulas, as we can see on the right. For example, here for A, which stands for alanine. As an output data or we, what we wanted to predict, uh, we had the index retention times, uh, which uh, corresponds to the time when the specific peptide eludes on the liquid chromatographic column. And then, uh, uh, the tandem mass spectra. Uh, these consist from the mass uh, over uh, charge ratios and the relative intensities of the fragments there. Uh, this we can use as a vector. But uh, we have a little problem here with the sequences. So on the next slide, uh, uh, we will show you the different ways how to deal uh, with the sequences as and input data. First, uh, we have to tokenize the sequences. And in our case, one token would be one letter, and that means one amino acid. Uh, when we have the tokens, uh, then we need to associate them to the vectors. Uh, the easiest, the simplest way is one hot encoding. Uh, so we would have a vector with single one for the specific amino acid, and then the rest are zeros. But uh, this uh, solution uh, treats all the amino acid as an independent. And sometimes you would like to use more information from the biological point of view. Uh, what I mean by that, uh, if you use blossom encoding uh, for the amino acid, where each row corresponds to one amino acid, uh, you are using matrix that was created uh, with information in mind, uh, which comes from evolution. Because some amino acids uh, are similar or interchangeable. And this reflects how easy are the pairs of amino acids interchangeable. You would uh, use uh, this approach, especially in the, in the problems uh, when you are trying to predict peptide binding sites or drug when drugs are binded uh, to the proteins in your body. And of course, we can look to the NLP field and take an expression from text processing. Then we would use uh, dense uh, vectors uh, word embeddings. And uh, you could get them basically in two different ways. Uh, you can train a model in an unsupervised way with a lot of data to get onto the embeddings, or you can let the model learn it itself alongside uh, the main task, for example, prediction of the IRTs. 
And last but not least, you can always create your own futures, handcrafted futures, but this approach uh, is usually more suitable for classical machine learning and not deep learning. In the table below uh, are some examples of uh, published models that were predicting, predicted uh, retention times. And we can see that uh, the most used input encoding was actually the one-hot encoding or uh, the word embeddings. And uh, regarding the architecture of the neural network, uh, we can see either convolutional neural networks or recurrent neural networks or the combination of them. I would stay here a little bit longer or especially on the next slide with PROSIT model, uh, which was basically our inspiration because at uh, that time when we started to think about using our own deep learning models, they published a paper when they were actually predicting both quantities that we wanted to predict. So uh, we looked at how they did them, uh, did that, and they used uh, sequences only to predict the IRTs. And these sequ sequences uh, were encoded in vectors uh, with a length of 30 uh, and uh, non zero values corresponded uh, to. A specific amino acid, and if the sequence was shorter than 30, they padded it with zeros. For the fragment intensities prediction, uh, they use not only the sequences as an input, but also precursor charge and normalized collision energy, uh, basically some settings on the instruments. So we saw or we read <laughs> that it could be done. But we have a little bit of different data and a little bit of different problems. So we created our own models. And we started with the simpler task of these two, and this was prediction of IRTs. And the results we can see on the next slide. Uh, we used sequences with one hot encoding uh, to predict the index retention times. So, and as a metric, uh, we were using uh, root mean square error and our target was to get under five, which you can see we achieved. And also our squared score was pretty nice with 0 0.99, almost 0 0.99. And we didn't use that much data for this model, so it could always be improved. Uh, so we had the easier task done. And now the question was, could we predict also the fragment intensities? For this was uh, really important to uh, set the proper metric, uh, how to compare the spectra. And as we can see on the next slide, we used something that's called spectral contrast angle or spectral angle, which in short and in ba basic line is uh, something based on cosine similarity. And if you imagine that our relative fragment intensities are a vector. We are comparing and measuring angle between vectors for the predicted spectra uh, with our uh, true spectra. So when we look now at ideal, uh, ideal state, <laughs> uh, when we predict everything right, then we would like to see really nice uh, uh, high, a sharp peak on the right, uh, close to the one, because spectral angle ranges from zero to one. And how we, <laughs> we actually uh, predicted, we can see on the next slide, uh, you can see that it's not that ideal as the tweak data before <laughs> we used to plot uh, the histogram, but it was uh, pretty nice, a little bit wider, but it worked. That was the most important thing here. We use sequences with embeddings, uh, more, much more complex model than for the IRT's prediction. It was uh, bigger and it was also slower. And we also used much more data for it. Lucy, just a question here. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, you both can turn to gallery view so we can see us uh, all the time. 
Um, Lucy, there was one question from the audience from Laurent who was asking why embeddings uh, would have, uh, have been used um, because it's a low dimensional space, it's 20 dimensional space only. And he says, or mentions embeddings is usually used for dimensional dimensionality reduction. So what was the reason for using embeddings? Yeah, we actually tried uh, different uh, encoding and the embeddings worked best. And even if it's only 20 amino acids, uh, we had uh, peptides that were over 50 amino acids long. So then it started to grow. So the embeddings were in the end, or the word embeddings were in the end better for us. Thanks. But uh, if, and we are speaking now about the sequences and uh, as an input, and you could see that the, the both models had the same input. So the idea that you get from this is why are we not using multitask model, right? Because we would like to use the advantages for, from it. And, and uh, you have one model that is faster than two single models. Uh, we wouldn't have that much problems with overprinting, for example. Uh, so we uh, took this way and used the model for fragment intensities as a base, and then attach specific layers for each task. Uh, we were, of course, afraid of some disadvantages like cross-task interference, but uh, these two quantities looks like that they help each other. They are not contradicting. Uh, we didn't have problem with needing more data. We used more data, but we were lucky enough that our lab provided us enough data to train the model. And uh, what was a little bit tricky that uh, both the tasks were learning at a different rate. We saw earlier with the single task models that prediction of IRT is easier. Uh, so we had to use a little bit weighted loss function to correct these. And if we compare the single mod task models but, and multitask model on the next slide, uh, we can see the, uh, the distribution of spectral angles for multitask model in a red and single task in gray, and then some statistics uh, in the table on the right, uh, we can see that for the fragment intensity, the multitask model here was a little bit worse than the single task, but uh, using multitask helped uh, the IRTs. But I have to be honest here that we are not showing you here our best multitask model. We are showing you, let's say, good enough and fast model because the goal of the whole deep learning uh, model development was to include the model in our software. So if we had a big, complex, slow multitask model with the best predictions, it would be nice, but we uh, wouldn't be able to use it in the software because it would be super slow. So that's why we chose something in the middle uh, with uh, with a good speed and good accuracy. And how it ended up in the model, we could see on the next slide. Uh, when we... You basically had a restriction regarding performance, as you said. Did you do some testing uh, in the software, how it slows down? Was it part of... Uh, yeah, of course, uh, it's also showed uh, a little bit here on this slide. We use different uh, architectures for the model, more complex, less complex one once in the software and then we chose uh, the best uh, uh, fast uh, the best speed and identification ratio yeah. and uh, that what i am showing you here uh, is the chosen one, chosen multitask model compared with the single task models and using the software without uh, deep learning at all for specific analysis uh, so we can see that uh, in terms of peptide precursor identifications, which is one of the metrics in our software, uh, the IDs uh, were higher uh, for 10%, and it was comparable with the single task model. So we didn't lose any IDs with the multitask model, even if it was 
uh, wars uh, with the statistics. But what was important for us was the time. And this you can see on the right. In comparison, single task and multitask model, there's a significant uh, difference in time. Of course, we increased the time of the analysis a little bit, but we also gained the IDs. So we were pretty happy with this, and this model was then released with the software. And how we actually implemented the, the model in the software will tell you them now. Thanks, Lucy. Um, I got an answer from somebody from the audience <laughs> for the previous question about the differences between tandem mass spectrometry and cross-link uh, mass spectrometry. Um, there are really different things. Tandem mass spectrometry is really having two mass spectrometers, one after the other. Uh, Cross-linking uh, mass spectrometry means that proteins that uh, interact with each other uh, are glued together uh, with a chemical and then analyzed with uh, uh, one uh, mass spectrometer. So it's really a, a very different kind of use case. Thank you for the info. <laughs> awesome. Um, so now that we have a model, can we actually make use of it in a production setting? So let's talk about that. Uh, as we have heard a few weeks ago in another Pi and AI meetup, uh, MLOps or model ops is a very interesting offshoot from the very successful DevOps practice for software development uh, and deployment. Uh, running uh, machine learning models are very different. They have very specific challenges, and some of them I've written down here. Uh, we normally prefer to be able to run machine learning models online and in real time. Uh, another challenge is that data distributions can change uh, or will change almost constantly. And finally, you're most likely to have to handle long, messy, uh, long-tailed real-world data that is uh, humans and humans' behavior. Uh, so for instance, take as an example the uh, recommendation engines for your next Netflix show. It will have no value for you if you have to wait 30 minutes for the inference to finish. Uh, what you want to watch next might really change depending on what you have watched before. So maybe after the fifth true crime show, you want you are ready to have that few good Pixar movie instead of the next uh, true crime show. And sometimes you maybe just feel like watching a holiday movie, even if you normally hate those things. Those are really random behavior that are really centric to human, human behavior. Uh, these things make it very hard to have an actual useful machine learning model and MLOps try to alleviate these challenges by constantly monitoring and updating models uh, in a very reproductive way, uh, reproducible way. Uh, however, we don't have the same kind of challenges in our field. We usually don't have to update our model because of distribution changes, because the laws of physics and chemistry really don't change that abruptly, at least not that we know of. And human behavior really does not feed back into our models. Even if you wish to have more IDs, it won't, if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. Uh, and everything you, anything you change won't help with that. So experimental apparatus can change from time to time because new machines are being developed, uh, techniques are, are uh, perfected, uh, changed. Uh, but compared to the normal release cycle of our software, that will be relatively slow. But we do have some different challenges here. Uh, most of them coming from the fact that we develop Windows desktop applications. Our uh, clients uh, for, from a company are mostly academic labs. They have very strict IT security and firewall rules, and they run their software locally on their heavy Windows machines. Concretely, this means that we have to say no to on-premise deployment. That is on our hardware, on our site uh, in the company. We have no control of the, uh, on the IT infrastructure. We have no control whether GPU is available for us to run inference on, and we cannot do online training using the data that is not ours. Having to use Windows uh, also means saying no to Linux. Everything has to be programmed in uh, C Sharp, but we use Python and PyTorch to train our deep learning models, and we cannot use PyTorch to run inference on our models. And we have to say no to cloud. Uh, we are not running on controlled hardware or virtual machines. We, we, can't use, uh, we can't separate our machine learning model as a microservice that can be called individually. And we can't use the normal things that you would use in DevOps, Docker, containers in general, or Kubernetes. All of these things are off limits. Uh, 
So, but let me emphasize here before I get a lot of angry emails that I'm not against any of these technologies. I like Linux, I like Docker, I like Kubernetes, I like the cloud. We just can't use them. So the approach that we have taken might be useful for you, even if you are deploying to the cloud. Uh, so let me introduce Onyx to you. Uh, I have no affiliation with uh, this project, but they are really a nice project in my view, and uh, it, it's worth knowing uh, that it exists. Onyx stands for Open Neural Network Exchange and is an open standard for machine learning. So many people are working on great tools, but developers are sometimes or very often locked in one framework or ecosystem, something that is uh, imposed to them on them by, um, by management, for instance. Onyx allows you to export your models into a common format for deployment. Uh, as you can see, it, it supports a lot of common uh, machine learning frameworks, in school, including some obscure ones. I have never heard of NeoML, for instance. I don't know what the CAT stands for there. But uh, the more famous one like Keras and TensorFlow and PyTorch are also supported. Uh, additionally, not just deep learning models are supported, but also sklearn and uh, sgboost, the uh, gradient um, machine. Once you have your model uh, exported into the Onyx format, there are several uh, choices that you can use to run inference with. If you know the exact chipset that you're running your inference on, you can choose one of the specific ones. So if you have a GPU, uh, you can choose the NVIDIA one. If you know you have only Intel AI, uh, Intel uh, CPUs, you can use that. Or if you're running something on the edge, you can choose that specific Qualcomm uh, runtime that you, that you want. Uh, the nice thing is that you get acceleration uh, if it exists out of the box. So this is sort of abstracted away. Since we want to be as generic as possible, we choose something called the Onyx runtime right here in the middle. The Onyx runtime is a Microsoft open source project for cross-platform cross inference and training. So our use case is to use Onyx runtime is of course, we, because we train our models in Python and PyTorch, but we deploy it, we have to deploy it in a C-sharp Windows application. Uh, but a lot of other operations, operating systems, uh, programming languages, and uh, accelerators are also um, supported, including um, TensorRT, which is uh, uh, from NVIDIA, but also OpenVINO, which is from Intel, and even you can even run it on uh, some ARM uh, ARM uh, CPUs. So running inference in C# -sharp is actually very simple. Uh, you can run your Onyx model in just three lines of C-sharp code. Uh, a good thing to notice here is that the model is loaded here as an external file. You can see uh, it calls new inference session with the model file path, which points to that Onyx file where you save your uh, model in. Uh, this has consequences for uh, when we want to update the model. So the way we run our software has consequences on the operations part. Uh, as we just saw, our models are fully isolated and running on the client side. Uh, we have the luxury to keep training and updating our models on our side, and the client would never notice uh, until, we wanted, until we wanted them to. In fact, multiple versions of the model can be running at the same time in the world without anybody notice, noticing anything different. Uh, the model is encoded in an external files, like I said before. So inference code in C-sharp doesn't actually have to be changed with every model. The uh, thing you have to, of course, know is that the input and output don't change from model to model because that will be um, that really changes how you interact with the model, and that requires, of course, changes in the C# -sharp code. But if that doesn't happen, you will basically don't need to change anything on the C# -sharp code. So in principle, you could update the models completely separately from the entire code base. You know, of course, this is not recommended by DevOps plus practices, so we don't do that, but it is possible. Uh, instead, what we have decided to do is to only change the model significantly between major versions. So additionally, uh, additionally, all previous versions are versionized. So we can install an old version of the model of our software and run your analysis again, and it will give you exactly the same results as before. Uh, this is also important for scientific publications because reproducibility is the cornerstone of scientific practice. So you need to be able to run your own uh, old analysis with the old version, the old model again, and you will have the same results. We leave the ability to update to the latest and greatest up to our customers. So we 
give them a pop-up form that the new version is out and we allow the user to opt in. Uh, so that with that, uh, actually, this looks like a really good place to stop. Uh, we can summarize here. We have shown that deep learning models can predict scientific quantities without actually knowing the underlying scientific principles. Uh, we have also shown that these deep learning models can enhance already existing data analysis pipelines with new informative features. Uh, when inference, is a, uh, inference time is an issue, multitask models can be a valid approach to speed up inference time. And finally, Onyx and Onyx runtime are very good frameworks for deep learning inference in Windows desktop applications and possibly other applications too. Uh, as a last slide, I would like to thank the following people from the bioinformatics and R&D teams at Diagnosis for the help and support. And I would like to thank all of you for your attention. Thanks, thanks Timothy and thank you Lucy. I hope everyone is uh, hearing me quite good, Darius mentioned that there might be problems to understand me correctly, or it's not loud enough. I hope you can hear me. Uh, yeah, thanks again for the presentation. Uh, it's uh, now up to you. If you have questions, let's uh, let's go and tell me if questions. Uh, for me, it was interesting because uh, one of the aspects I found uh, quite uh, interesting to look at was uh, using models in a software environment which uh, moves from a server to a client system, which was interesting. So from, from the learnings from what you had in, in your daily job now in, in the past as well, um, what, how does the process differ from having models run, running on the server side and uh, running um, both kind of models inside of a software component, which needs to be transportable in some ways? How does that differ? Um, I think the main difference is that we have to keep um thinking about inference speed and things like that we have more constraints in terms of um also in in terms of how we um design a model because a lot of models nowadays are we have we just throw billions of parameters at them and it runs on the tpu or something in the cloud anyway so we don't really care about how long it takes for it to train or to to run we have different kind of constraints uh, it has to be able to run on a CPU in a normal, uh, reasonable time because we we want uh, we don't want our clients to be waiting forever for the deep learning part to to, to finish. And because of that, that um, yeah, that gives us constraints on how uh, we design our models. We cannot have the greatest and best in a model with the uh, biggest parameter space ever because it just wouldn't work on their side. Yeah, understandable. Uh, do you give recommendations regarding the hardware which needs to be used to run the model? Yes, the proteomics data analysis pipeline is by itself is pretty heavy. So uh, depending on the hardware that you are running it on, it can take uh, up to months, depending on your experiment as well. So we, our software already has a pretty heavy minimum requirement. You need to have a certain uh, CPU. I don't remember the minimum requirement, but for instance, RAM has to be at least 128 gigabytes of RAM. Uh, this space has to be, I think, half a gig, half a terabyte of free space there. And there are some limitations that are uh, already there. Uh, we don't have, so we we don't, we can of course also require the our clients to suddenly install a GPU and and, and Nvidia before we we uh, sell them the software. But unfortunately, that was just one step too far. Okay. Yeah, it was just interesting because I know when companies like Palantir, for example, usually ship, uh, ship their products in combination with hardware uh, to a little bit more control the way of experience for model part as well. So we have a question from the audience again. I hope uh, I just read it. Post translation and modifications of pept peptides lead to a mass shift, but we can also influence a relative peak intensity in the MSMS pattern. Uh, E.g. glycans, are you also able to predict relative peak intensities of modified peptides? Could you use that to be more sure of your peptide ID, the type of PTM and its localization? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, it sounds like we have an expert in the audience. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Someone knows <laughs> about the problem, sir. <laughs> 
Uh, we do. Uh, our model is actually one of the few that supports um, several modifi modifications. Uh, one of the things that we really want to, for instance, have in our models, which we don't uh, really have yet, is uh, phosphor modifications, which is very important biologically. Uh, it's a hard problem because it has uh, it will shift your peak quite a bit uh, in in mass uh, charge space. And you have a lot more possibilities. But once you have it, you can basically uh, pinpoint the modification to the exact amino acid way better than without uh, having this as a um, uh, as a feature. Um, you you mentioned um, model ops um, at the end. Um, so you were actually referring to the uh, meetup episode we had indeed a few weeks ago. Uh, thanks, thanks for doing that. Um, uh, in, in terms of updates of the models, how often do you update the model? How often are software updates actually necessary? So our uh, software is updated um, as needed in terms of uh, bug fixes and things like that. But we have a year release cycle where we have a major change in our software with new features, uh, improvements, and things like that. If we have something like going back to the previous question about post translational modifications, if we have new post translational modifications supported, we will only ship it with each release, which uh, fixed uh, yearly cycle. The rest, the smaller ones, if you have tweaks in um, yeah, small predictions and things like that, we can ship it continuously. Thanks, thanks for being so patient with all the questions. Uh, you both of you, thank you. And thanks again for the presentation. I'm, I'm looking at the questions. I think you've probably done a perfect job in answering uh, most questions which might have been there. And again, thank you both of you for taking the time this evening to show us and lead us a little bit into your area of expertise. Uh, we got nice feedback from the audience again. Uh, Susanne Müller, thanks a lot for this. Gerard Dupont, good presentation, thanks. So thumbs up from my side as well. And thank you everyone who joined this evening for just being part of it. I don't know what time it is on your side, we know, I know that usually we have a lot of time zones here participating. For some it's evening, for some it's morning. Whatever time it is, I wish you have a nice time and um, please stay safe in this corona times everyone thanks again everyone and say goodbye thank you all thanks for the invitation and thanks for listening to us <laughs>